so yeah, thanks very much. Um, my apologies for the technical difficulties. This is not quite the setup that I wanted, but it'll it'll probably do. Um, so what I'm talking about today is joint work with my former PhD student, uh, Luca Kurt, who graduated um, last year and uh, with, uh, with Michael Ortiz, who gave some input on what dislocations do or do not do. Um, so um, my apologies in advance. Uh, the, the proofs of what we did are somewhat technical and notation intensive. So I'm trying to just give you the ideas. Um, feel free to ask me if you need any more uh, details about this, but I thought for an online workshop, it's a bit tricky with too much stuff on the slides. Um, also, in addition to that, um, for a while at least, it seemed illegal uh, to have a conference that I'm at where uh, it's not mentioned what dislocations are. So I'm going to do this uh, here. So what are we looking at? Um, we're looking at uh, a, a, a crystalline uh, solid here, and we want to get it from this state to the state on the top right corner. So basically sheared, that is plastic deformation. You shear one atomic layer over the other. Um, now, as probably most of you have heard or seen at some point, you cannot do this just by taking the whole uh, upper half of this crystal and moving it over in one piece. So how is this done? It's by propagating a, an object, a, a defect through the crystal that's called a dislocation. So here is um, a picture of a dislocation that probably seems oddly familiar to a lot of you. Uh, so this is the uh, completely undeformed crystal that you see here with a perfect, in this case, sort of cubic lattice. And this is sort of a picture in between. Let me add this picture here, where basically I shifted over this row of atoms, one to the right. This one, the next row of atoms, also almost one to the right. And then I have to squeeze this additional row in here. And those are basically, again, where they belong. And this point where there is an additional row of atoms compared to what you see below. Um, so this thing is called a dislocation. And as you can see in this three-dimensional picture, it is, a, um, it is essentially a line-like object that goes through the crystal here, right? So in some sense, this is, this, is I mean, this is exactly the picture that you're seeing here. And what you can also see if this sort of propagates over here and then over here and all the way to the end at some point, sort of this line is normal again, and I have this extra row of atoms here, and then we're in this picture. I hope that makes sense. Now you can forget again all of this because all I'm going to look at, I mean, this is more for physical context somehow. Uh, you can somehow forget it again because all I'm going to look at for the rest of this talk is this blue air, this, uh, this blue surface here, uh, which is called a slip plane. It's basically a plane in the crystal, some crystallographically specific plane uh, that those dislocations can move in. Right, so it can be sort of any kind of line-like object in this blue plane. So here it's drawn, this is the dislocation, and this is basically what we're gonna look at for the remainder of this talk. So these dislocations, as I mentioned, they're one-dimensional curves within a specific two-dimensional plane in the crystal. Um, and what we're interested now, because in general, this is not just a undisturbed plane, there will usually be some kind of obstacles here. For example, uh, the common way to have obstacles here is dislocations in other planes that are more or less orthogonal to this slip plane. I mean, there are many slip planes in this crystal. So there could be sort of a dislocation going through the crystal, piercing this plane here. And now if this dislocation that's coming here wants to move past it, it will feel some kind of resistance to go through here. Well, this is something called strain hardening or uh, cross hardening sometimes also called. Um, so these things are called forest dislocations because they look like 
basically a forest within this slip plane because they're basically sort of other line-like objects placed piercing here. Could be also something else. Um, in uh, engineering, you often put some kind of other materials in there that precipitates out in order to harden uh, your material, in order to make it harder, more difficult for dislocations um, to propagate through. So we want a model for this, a uh, model for a uh, line like objects. Now, another thing that I didn't tell you. So basically uh, those objects, a dislocation is a defect in the crystal. And as usual, these defects cost some additional energy. And since this is a line like defect, it is very reasonable to say, it's also an approximation that it costs basically an energy per unit length. So we have a, Curve shortening flow naturally with some obstacles in the plane. So let's say this is my gamma of T is the plane that goes there. It can penetrate and cut through these obstacles somehow, provided that locally the force is high enough. And what we would know, so what our question was, and this is sort of the scaling question, is if the density of this obstacle is fairly, fairly small, how much force do I need in order to propagate my uh, line all the way through the crystal uh, in order to overcome this resistance so that it doesn't get stuck. So this is sort of the question that we're looking at. So here is the first part of this model that I already said. So this is a curvature flow uh, the, to connect it also to the free boundaries uh, questions that we had here. So the normal velocity of a point on a curve is the curvature plus some external driving force because I'm taking the crystal and I'm shearing it to make those dislocations propagate. Okay, this is relatively simple still. Now let's add those obstacles. So here is basically, let's say those obstacles are somehow randomly distributed in this plane. Then I model them by taking a function phi that depends on sort of the position in the plane. And let's say this function is somehow positive inside those obstacles and zero everywhere else. That's how I write down my obstacles. And those who have seen a talk of mine probably have seen this before. Um, right. Um, now, clearly, if I'm at a point, then I need some additional force to propagate through there. So this is this random function modeling the obstacles that I added here. Now, there is um, one minor flaw because now this thing clearly has um, a direction, which I don't really want. I would like, right, because now sort of depending on uh, uh, which direction I go, this force is either positive or negative. And this is something I would kind of like to avoid. So one thing that we added here is the following. Uh, we instead uh, take a... Um, localized dry friction that has to be overcome. So this, in this case, um, is some kind of dissipation kind of potential. And uh, I take the subdifferential of it. And what I'm taking here is basically uh, dr as the subdifferential of the absolute value. So now, of course, this is a set valued equation, right? It's a differential inclusion, which we will see it doesn't have to disturb us very much. Uh, but what does this mean now? Now, basically, uh, heuristically, what we achieved now is that this additional friction or this additional, well, that this additional force that we have where we pass through those obstacles really acts like a friction. It always acts counter to the normal velocity, right? So in particular, if I have my obstacle here and my dislocation is already stuck, it will cost some force to move it out of the obstacle. It'll cost some force to move it through the obstacle. And this is in that sense, a dry friction. It doesn't depend on the velocity. In other words, to get across one of those obstacles, I will have to pay uh, a certain amount of energy that is just accumulates as the more ob obstacles I pass, right? It's a rate independent friction, if you will. Okay, so this is the one thing. Um, so here we are. 
And then there is another thing that we can or we must, we, we don't have to add this to the model, uh, but it doesn't hurt in this case either. And it makes it slightly more realistic because also normal dislocations do not follow a simple viscous mean curvature flow due to the crystalline nature. I mean, you saw that those dislocations were basically sort of crystalline objects that sort of look like this. And then I have to move them over to the next free slot here. Um, this leads to the fact that even in a completely undisturbed crystal, I need a certain minimal force to make it work. But compared to the other forces in the, in the system, this is not very large. So what we do here is we write down some kind of kinetic relation uh, between the normal velocity and the driving force. And this will also be of this rate independent type because this is the, the highest friction that dislocations have is a, even in an undisturbed crystal is sort of this rate independent uh, thing. So this is our example here. We have a what's called a lattice friction. The, the name I think is rather suggestive of what it does. A lattice friction and again, subdifferential of the absolute value here uh, so that again, we, we only propagate if we're if we're pushing at least tau zero anywhere, um, and it still sort of has some viscous term which we need in order to have solutions for this equation. Uh, but this, I mean, I can also put some some constant in front of this and make it very small, and then it's not unrealistic because at least at very high velocities, dislocations do have some sort of rate dependent friction. So this is our well, geometric evolution inclusion, if you will, um, which is not unreasonable. And we start this with a dislocation that's basically at the bottom of my crystal, at one end of the crystal, at y equals zero. And we want to propagate it through the crystal and see what happens. Now, um, the first thing that we have to show is that even reasonable solutions exist for this. So we write this, rewrite this as a level set equation, which you see here. So we basically do mean curvature, level set mean curvature flow, but with somewhat non-trivial uh, uh, terms that give me, uh, that make it a differential inclusion. And it turns out, and this I don't, didn't want to go into great detail here um, because it's relatively technical, but you can indeed prove existence of viscosity solutions and an associated comparison principle for this kind of differential inclusion. The, okay, so what I'm telling you now will probably only make sense if you know how to prove existence or how to prove a, a comparison principle uh, for the uh, sort of standard level set mean curvature flow. Uh, but then it probably makes sense because, okay, so you do essentially the same thing. So you, um, so, okay, so there's some nonlinearity here, which you absorb by doing some exponential rescaling of this thing. So you, 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 um, that's sort of irrelevant. It's also standard for viscosity solutions to get rid of, to absorb an, a non-monotonicity that is Lipschitz into sort of um, the, the monotone parts of your, of your equation. But then you still have to take care of this thing and essentially the same term here, which you can lump together somehow. Um, but this somehow works in this, cases that are here physically interesting, because what you do is this variable doubling, right? You look at u of x and t and, y, uh, and, and v of y and tau that are somehow close together, but then one past the other. And then you look at sort of a specific point there where they maximally passed each other. And then you get a comparison that the, the time, the velocity of the one that passed, as well as the position of it, must be sort of ahead of the other one. But then if you plug those two into your subdifferential, because this is mono, it's maximally monotone. So if the subdifferential looks like this, and sort of your velocity of one solution is here, and the velocity of the other solution is somehow here, which you get by sort of having one past the other, then you have a comparison principle in this set valued subdifferential. And that works very nicely. It works surprisingly well, 
the rest is more or less standard. Okay. Clearly, so we get a unique viscosity solution of this from comparison principle. Um, by then using Perron's method. So another thing is also clear. If my force is bigger, well, it's okay. So bigger than tau zero plus the supremum of phi, then we also have a propagating solution. Then I can use a flat sort of subsolution that I const constantly propagate, and that will be a propagating subsolution that will that will sweep the whole thing. But that's not a good estimate for what we have. So that's not sharp enough somehow. So what we want is to see what are the critical forces for propagation here. Sorry, may I ask a question about yes, this sure, of course. slide? Um, so, so what is this eta, this function eta? Uh, this is, okay, so this is, um, I, I, I sort of skipped it on purpose, <laughs> but of course you saw it. Um, Try to hide this. This is nothing particular. Uh, this is basically a, a radial symmetric function that at zero, we make one. And then after some point eta, uh, is, uh, is zero. So since we're only interested in the zero level set of our solution, this is enough to consider uh, the equation for u near zero. And then in the end, we're just using it so that um, this location, so, so obstacles that are somehow nearby don't get in the way of constructing our subsolution. Mm -hmm. you Does just that make sense? When you do uh, kind of, it's not uh, geometric in the sense that it depends on the level set, right? So, so you can't relabel the level sets. Yes, that's true. So, yeah. But okay. it doesn't, I mean, still the zero level set of this will follow this. Yeah, the zero, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's the only thing I'm interested in. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is basically just to cut it off so that we don't have to worry about anything far away from the zero level set. That's more or less the idea. Okay. So then we define sort of two critical forces. Uh, one where we say that if F is bigger than this lower critical force, then our solution is in some sense ballistic that uh, this sort of dislocation that we're interested in sort of, well, at least passes over some positive area in unit time. So this basically means that you have a plastic flow. Uh, and then another critical force, which means that it gets pinned, that it gets it's stuck near where, we, where it started. Okay, so these are the critical forces. Okay, it's relatively heuristic, as I said, but okay. So now if we take our obstacles in a reasonable sense, namely that we uh, distribute them by a two-dimensional Poisson process with intensity lambda, make them little bumps and make them reasonably smooth so that we don't run into any trouble that I don't care about. So, but then we have a Poisson distributed um, obstacles here in our plane, which is about as reasonable as it can get. Um, then our main result is exactly the square root scaling that was, um, well, that was sort of derived uh, by Taylor for forest dislocations and by Friedel for uh, solution hardening as also for uh, other materials that are that are in this in this in this plane um, where um, what you get is we do not propagate is uh, if our applied sort of external shear force is below well this is the critical force to overcome uh, this um, uh, lattice friction. But then in addition, we get an additional friction from the obstacles and it's the square root of their density basically. And similarly on the other side, so this is kind of an optimal scaling result. Uh, we get the, exactly the same scaling with a different, vastly different constant in the proof. Uh, uh, for a ballistic propagating solution. And uh, this is essentially exactly this, um, the same scaling as was derived by uh, Taylor, that basically whatever excess you need, um, 
square root of the density of obstacles in excess of lattice friction to get plasticity. That's exactly what it says here. Critical force minus lattice friction. Scales like square root of lambda, then you get plastic flow. Okay. This is, of course, in the regime of small lambda, right? This is where we're very dilute obstacles. Okay. Um, if you take sort of a vanishing viscosity limit where you go through uh, F is only lattice friction, which is physically reasonable, then somehow the results hold up uh, because at least sort of you surely remain bounded in that setting. Okay, so what's the stationary super solution that we want to construct? If our um, lambda, uh, if our force is small, so this is sort of similar to an older paper. Uh, here, you first do the following. You first use sort of a percolation result to, to, to uh, identify uh, a, a basically a, 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 a more or less horizontal line of obstacles that are not too far away from each other. And from there, you do a very simple construction. You basically connect them by circle arcs because here you need a circle arc with sort of negative curvature to counteract your force. And here you have your obstacle force. You can put in these obstacles as a circle arc with positive curvature uh, because that gets counteracted by the friction. Okay, so that's maybe not so surprising. And then you use that essentially the distance between is square of those is squared of lambda. You still have to be careful with your, your percolation result. Um, that this all works out. But then in the end, you track the constants. And I, I mean, this is a bit of a scaling uh, uh, relation that in the end, as long as your excess force is not bigger than square root of lambda modulo a small constant, um, you get, uh, you can construct this stationary super solution. Um, and from the stationary graphical super solution, uh, you kind of uh, construct a stationary super solution to your level set equation. And that's where this cutoff comes from. In some sense, that's where we use this cutoff because uh, I don't want to worry by constructing the level set solution about these obstacles here, for example. Right? So then that means that I only have to look at obstacles in a small neighborhood here, and then we're fine. And uh, the more interesting construction, in some sense, is a propagating subsolution because it's a little odd and it's far away from reality, but it works for this kind of thing. So first we put some grid over our whole thing uh, and we put a grid where this length is roughly square root of lambda. Square root of lambda times a small constant. Um, but then we use another sort of Lipschitz percolation result. That's not ours, uh, but was found somehow. Um, you can put sort of channels through there if the scaling is okay. Channels that look like this. That don't intersect any obstacles. Okay, but now in some sense, it's relatively easy because now you can put uh, like this fingering kind of uh, mean curvature flow solution in these channels. Uh, because if the channel width that you can choose is about square root of lambda and your force is about square root of lambda, then sort of adding a little bit of additional length or additional uh, um, line length here will count will be sort of compensated by the additional gain you make by propagating this. I think that makes sense, right? So these, of course, you have to construct relatively explicitly and make sure that under the right condition, they really sort of take a finite time to propagate through each of these little boxes. And then you can piece your solution together by these individual uh, parts. Okay, to take care that you nicely pass around corners and things like that, but that's basically the idea. Again, as I said, tracking the constants, you get the same square root power. So in the end, that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, I hope this was interesting to at least uh, uh, some of you. Might be a slightly different flavor than what we've heard before, but um, 
Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Patrick. So is there any other question or comment? Uh, Harald, please, I... Um, yes, you can hear me? Yeah. Um, so when you have um, this viscosity solution for mean curvature flow, usually this um, uh, fattening phenomena can occur. Now you have uh, additional mechanism there. So do you have any um, feeling for uh, what happens with respect to, uh, to uh, the qualitative behavior of solutions, for example, with respect to fattening? So the, the one thing is, uh, it, it, this kind of, sorry that I flicked through here like this, uh, uh, this kind of thing, it's, I, I, okay, so we haven't actually studied the fattening things in great detail. I cannot imagine that uh, making this a differential inclusion will make the fattening phenomenon any better. There is no way this is going to help. No, no, but worse, maybe. <laughs> it might make it worse. That's entirely possible that it might make it worse. However, for what we're looking at here, it's irrelevant somehow, right? Because our constructed sub and super solutions do not have any fattening because we sort of rather explicitly construct them. Their zero level sets are nice line objects. And then, okay, so now take anything that you would consider a reasonable solution of this or of this, it will definitely stay below the constructed super solution, for example, if you're looking for pinning. Whether your original equation has fattening or not, doesn't really matter for this, but with any reasonable model for your dislocation evolution that you come, can come up with, it will stay below the super solution of this. So in some sense, it doesn't really matter, right? As long as I have sort of comparison. And that's, that's true whether you have fattening or not. I mean, you could think of like resolving the fattening uh, by some kind of uh, thing. You could take sort of a, a maximal a super solution, uh, you can take a, a maximal sub solution here or something like that, um, but that will still stay below your super solution. So that doesn't really matter, right? Okay, there's a second question, uh, please. Okay, uh, this is Yoshigiga. Uh, I have one question about obstacle. What, what kind of assumption do you assume for obstacle? No assumption, just randomly? Yeah, okay, so the obstacles... Pi. My question is pi. The obstacles, they're, they are basically sent with... They have centers that are uh, distributed by a Poisson process. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So they're uh -huh. as uniform as possible somehow. And then we basically, around the centers of this Poisson process, we make like small bumps that are reasonably smooth. I, well, the shits uh -huh. in this case. So that means uh, uh, the, you, you don't care about the shape or just the ball, just disc, what, what kind of shape? I, yeah, so, so in the end, we don't really have to care what exact shape they are. Um, yeah. But what we assume is that they are basically bounded from inside and outside by some disc. I see, I see. Right, sort of, okay. there, is a, a, there is a disc, uh, where uh, this function phi is equal, there's a small disk on which this function phi is equal to one. And then there's a larger disk where this function is zero again and smooth in between. That's basically the idea. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, Adriana, if you want to ask your question. Uh, yeah, if there is time, but I mean, it was just a curiosity because uh, it's an interesting result. And uh, I wonder uh, again about the obstacles, uh, what type of, uh, uh, so if you, for instance, uh, thought about uh, having some effective uh, dynamics coming from this model. So maybe taking some scaling of the obstacles and then maybe, I don't know, find some uh, effective distribution of the obstacles. Uh, do you 
where you may see some pinning phenomena uh, in a, an effective uh, evolution law. Do, did you think about that? Uh, yes, I've been thinking about this for years now with no result. Um, <laughs> I, mean, because, I mean, in some sense, if I am, am allowed to interpret your question a bit, you want in some sense a homogenization result. In a sense, yes, if you want. Yeah. So you want an effective evolution if I look at it from a very large scale. Exactly. So and there are a few the thresholds and the... Yeah. In, including a threshold, yes. Okay. So basically it should be large scale, a slightly perturbed mean curvature flow with a velocity that has a stick slip kind of behavior, exactly. yes. Exactly, it would be very nice. So um, the, the large force part of this for a mean curvature flow in a randomly, per, in a random obstacle is done by Ar uh, Scott Armstrong and Pierre Cardal Liagé. Mm -hmm. That's the situation where your force in some sense is very large. So at every point, you always have a strictly positive, uh, any point in time you have a bounded from below uh, velocity somehow. And then you get something very nice because then somehow uh, uh, the randomness evens out and you can get a, 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 a sublinearly growing um, perturbation to your solution from the randomness, because as usual, you get sort of this, 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 thing. this is a, okay. So the, the, this is a very difficult, this is a very tricky result. And I think it's not been possible to show anything so far where you get closer to the pinning threshold. I don't know of anything like that. I've tried for a while with not mean curvature flow, but with just the Laplacian here. And I'm not sure how to do it. It might actually be better to do it with a mean curvature flow. Because even for the linearization, even this result doesn't really hold. Because I very much need the possibility to not be graphical to make to prove this, this to, to construct a subsolution. Mm -hmm. As soon as I have to be graphical, I still don't know a lower bound, a nice lower bound like this, uh, or uh, sorry, a nice upper bound for the pinning threshold. So maybe this is the better way to do it. And I'm, I mean, I'm trying. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, let's uh, thank uh, the, the speaker of this, uh, the speakers of this, of this session again. <laughs>